Bulgarian journalist in exile, Georgi Markov, had left his home in South London at two o'clock in the afternoon to go to work. He would look for a parking space under the south end of Waterloo Bridge, as he usually did. He arrived there half an hour later and went up the stairs to the bridge. Since he was very athletic, he almost always walked from there to BBC's Bush House, his workplace on the other side of the Thames. Markov later described very briefly what had happened. He felt a stabbing pain in the back of his right thigh, turned around and saw a man picking up an umbrella. The man mumbled an apology and hurried away. He then saw the man hail a cab, speaking briefly with the driver, get in and drive off. Markov's afternoon shift for the Bulgarian broadcast of the BBC World Service began at three and ended at six o'clock. In the following two-hour break, he complained of a sharp pain in his thigh to his friend and co-worker Theo Lurkov. Markov showed him the spot, which Lurkov later described as a tiny red dot. Markov felt ill and went home after his evening shift, where according to his wife, he arrived around 10.30 in the evening. He didn't mention a single word to her about what had happened on Waterloo Bridge. It was only on the next evening, Friday, after his condition had obviously grown much worse, that a doctor finally sent him to the hospital. At 9 p.m., an ambulance took him to the emergency room at St. James's Hospital. Do you remember how Georgi Makov looked like when you saw him for the first time? He uh, looked ill, is the simple thing to say, in that he was rather flushed, he was obviously breathing quite rapidly and uh, he looked like a worried man, a man who knew that he wasn't at all well. And then he sort of sighed and laughed and said, I've been poisoned by the KGB and I'm going to die, there's nothing you can do about it. And at that point I had to decide whether he was uh, a paranoid defector or whether he was actually telling the truth. And then told me the, the, the story but the, uh, about standing on the bridge feeling as if he'd been stabbed or something. And he certainly showed signs and symptoms of uh, a toxemia or a severe infection. And when I examined him on the posterior part of his right thigh, there was a, 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 a swollen, indurated area of about six centimeters. And right in the middle of that, a tiny a puncture wound of about one to two millimeters. And Dr. Riley took Markov's claims of attempted murder quite seriously and informed Scotland Yard, which sent a police officer the next day. Sometime later, the Secret Service also sent an agent, but he couldn't interview Markov. He was no longer conscious. The next morning, I got a telephone call from the hospital just as I was leaving here to go there, saying that Georgie's heart had started giving out in the night and that I should come in straight away. So I did. And as soon as I got there, I realized for the first time that Georgie was dying. I could see it. And I know that if somebody's on the brink of death, you can sometimes pull them back if they want to live. And he did want to live. He never wanted to die. If you can get through to their subconscious. So I was trying to get him to fight. For I was saying, you've got to fight for Sasha and me. You've just got to. And he said, yes, Mama. And then I just saw the heart machine, I just saw it die away and I rushed out of the room and got a nurse and shortly after that he died. Georgi Markov died at 10.40 a.m. on September the 11th, four days after the attack, which went down in Cold War history as the Umbrella Murder. Initially we are treating it then as a death under very suspicious circumstances and certainly now we're regarding it as a murder inquiry. The day of the assassination was the 67th birthday of the Bulgarian dictator Todor Shivkov. Could the murder have been a sinister present for him?
The autopsy confirmed that Markov had been poisoned. Scotland Yard began an investigation and their suspicions soon focused on the Bulgarian secret services. However, the conflict between the East and West prevented any kind of investigation within the communist bloc. But how is it that this high-profile murder still remains unsolved, a whole 24 years after the collapse of the totalitarian systems in Eastern Europe? Even though the Bulgarian and British authorities allegedly continue to investigate the case, Markov murder was one of the most emblematic crimes of the Cold War. Mm -hmm. It was so mysterious, uh, so spectacular, you know the Bulgarians sending agents in London, of all places, and killing people in the, in the center of London, you know, that it spawned a lot of people's imagination. A lot of theories uh, came into circulation immediately after he was killed. And um, because of the failure of the British authorities to bring anybody to justice and to, to fully investigate the matter, understandable, because the Bulgarians at the time were not cooperating at all. I mean, at that time, for, for, for Scotland Yard, it was a live investigation, a live murder investigation, which had made headlines all around the world. So there were lots of journalists who, who wanted to find out. And also, it was a, very, it was a combination of a very topical story, uh, because a journalist had been murdered, uh, presumably by the, the secret service of another country, in broad daylight in London. Uh, and all the story of the, the poison umbrella and the, the whole James Bond aspect of it. It was an amazing story. Markov, a successful writer and playwright in Bulgaria, emigrated to the West in 1969 when a political chill set in and his plays were banned from the stage in his homeland. He began living in London in 1970 after trying unsuccessfully to settle in Italy and Germany. He had worked for the BBC World Service and Deutsche Welle since 1972. One of his colleagues very recently said to me, he was the glamour boy. Uh, he was also extraordinarily able professionally and with the very first scripts that he was writing and then broadcasting. Um, his colleagues were saying, this is a man of outstanding abilities. I remember the stories he told not only about the communist bosses of Bulgaria, but also against himself. He could laugh about himself too. Some of his stories about his unsuccessful attempts to seduce women were very funny. In 1972, he met his future wife Annabelle at the BBC, where she was working as a journalist. They got married in 1975, and a year later their daughter Sasha was born. Markov was killed at the age of 49. Für mein Programm hat Georgi Markov diese Reportage geschrieben, für die er später umgebracht worden ist. Er wurde nicht umgebracht wegen seiner literarischen Sesse und nicht auch wegen seiner Arbeit für BBC. During the Cold War era, Radio Free Europe broadcast around the clock to the Eastern Bloc countries, providing them with information from around the world, and most important of all, with information coming from the Eastern European countries themselves, news they would otherwise have no access to. Since 1975, Markov had been writing for the Bulgarian program In Absentia Reports, a series of 130 programs broadcast every Sunday evening at 8 o'clock, which attacked the communist rulers in Bulgaria. Radio Free Europe simply every single day made a program or programs to Bulgaria showing that the system was corrupt, the system was oppressive, and we did that every day. These programs were a fenster for, for millions of Bulgarians. They were a fenster to the outside world. That was a total isolated, uh, eingeschlossen Gesellschaft. Georgi Markov did not broadcast directly into Bulgaria. There were actors using his scripts. Those actors would emphasize certain words. You can call it propaganda, but it was simply a way of expressing as forcefully as possible, as emotionally as possible, what Georgi was writing. And Georgi Markov then on Sunday night would come forward with giving detailed information about Zhivkov and the nomenclature of the whole elite of the Communist Party. 
By doing that, by the combination of Radio for Europe and Georgi Markov, and probably even more for Georgi Markov, that meant again this was a personal attack on the system. We have to go back to the whole political background of what Bulgaria was. In 1978, it was a totalitarian government. They controlled the media, they controlled the press, they controlled everything within that country. underground network where people would would listen secretly it could it could be a crime even to to be tuned to the BBC or, or Radio Free Europe but there seemed evidence from various sources that um, his uh, programs especially the ones on Radio Free Europe uh, were hitting home deswegen haben sie auch unsere Sendungen immer gestört auf alle Wellen aber eine, eine Welle lang haben sie freigelassen, damit die Parteielite das hören kann. Uh, and what Georgi Markov was doing for Radio Free Europe was so devastating for, for the, the communists in Bulgaria was, was that he was he was unlocking the secret code. He said it was like a look, looking glass world. It was like an Ionesco play um, where a deaf mute goes in for a singing contest. Everything is double speak. The 18-year-old Georgi fooling around with his friend. At that time, he was still in harmony with his homeland. From the picture, you would never guess that he was seriously ill with tuberculosis, spending weeks and months at a sanitarium in the mountains near Sofia. Georgi was forced to interrupt his study of chemistry at the university which he had just begun. However, he now had lots of time for reading and most of all for writing. His first literary attempts date from this time. Но Георги имал много силно влечение към книгите още от дете. Аз мога да кажа една случка, която баща му една сутрин става в 5 часа сутринта. И го вижда Георги, понеже лампите са били много слаби тогава. В кухнята на масата е един стол и той под лампата сутринта в 5 часа чете, не си е лега. Реакцията на баща му е, абе, що не живееш, що не спиш нормално, взима всичките книги и ги фъде в печката. In 1952, at the age of 23, Markov finished his studies and experienced the reality of socialist labor firsthand as a young chemical engineer in this factory named Poor Beda, Victory, which he later described in detail in his novel Men. That was his first literary success. He won the Novel of the Year award from the Bulgarian Writers' Union and was accepted into the union without the usual weight. He also wrote his first plays, which enjoyed great success in Sofia and around the country. Through the Writers' Union, Markov got to know Todor Zhivkov, who liked to surround himself with members of Bulgaria's talented and ambitious intelligentsia. In, in Bulgaria, um, Zhivkov had a very close relationship with his artists. He fostered it deliberately. And um, yes, I mean, I don't think Georgie was a friend of his, but he was definitely in the circle. Um, and he was a very privileged writer. He had um, a wonderful car, BMW, and he had, he actually could travel abroad. You know, he gradually got sickened by the system and was writing more and more dangerous stuff in eine unfreie Gesellschaft als freier Mensch sich zu benehmen, ist immer gefährlich. Cervantes hat mal geschrieben, dass die Freiheit auf die Spitze des Speeres lebt. Die Freiheit von Georgi Markov vibrierte auf die Spitze seiner Feder. Georgi Markov gathered impressions from that circle of power, which he would later use in his story entitled Meetings with Todor Zhivkov. Те срещи, 
той описва какъв е Тодор Живков. И некои като говорят правешки селянита, Тодор Живков е една личност, която е с изключителна интуиция, с изключителна памет, човек, който не е, не е запоценяван. Then suddenly one of Markov's plays was pulled from the stage without any official reason being given and some of the actors were exiled to the countryside. Markov asked Yivkov for a meeting and managed to bring the actors back to Sofia. The play, however, remained cancelled. In despair, Markov wrote, In Bulgaria there is no censorship and nothing is banned. Certain plays are simply stopped. There is no official decision, just some vague obstacle, the times, the society, or the comrades. It was absurd to punish the actors. I wonder whether Zhivkov ever realized how absurd this was, even if only for a moment. Yet I too was taking part in this ludicrous play. I sensed that according to its logic, I needed to express my gratitude that he had mitigated my friend's harsh fate. I felt like a character in a Kafkaesque nightmare. Georgi Markov was a brilliant satirist, and satire is a very powerful weapon ag against dictators. They hate being made fun of more than uh, almost anything else. You know, he'd been right in, in the center of, of Todor Zhivkov's circle, and then he, he would do these devastating things for, for Radio Free Europe, where he would make fun of them, life behind the curtain. And he, he talked about how ambitious uh, uh, and how, how, how ruthless all these people were and seeking uh, advantage. And he said Pontius Pilate was a babe in arms compared to these apparatchiks in Bulgaria. I think is most relevant is the politics of corruption of the Bulgarian intellectuals. The Bulgarian uh, intellectual elites were co-opted into the network of government they were uh, put in uh, privileged positions, they were courted by uh, Todor Zhivkov himself, they were part of, uh, of, the, of the, so to say, of the court of the uh, dictator. And of course this was the story of Georgi Markov who, who, who chose to, to break with this corruptive uh, power and uh, he, uh, this had a high price. In the period where the Czechs were по време и след чешките събития 68-69 година на Георги му отпадат пет пиеси. След една генерална репетиция на пиесата Аз бях той, всичко това е много добре описано в задочите репортажи, той заминава. Марков left Bulgaria on June the 15th, 1969. He said goodbye to his mother and father, promising to come back in a few weeks. He would never see his homeland again. In a feeling of unbearableness, he wrote, the car was driving along the drying ash felt, and everything around me looked strange and indescribably beautiful, mercilessly beautiful, as if nature had decided to show me the priceless wealth of the land that I was doomed to lose. Perhaps those condemned to death meet their final dawn with the inhumanly long feeling that they are seeing everything for the last time. By 11.30 p.m. I was at the Excelsior Hotel in Belgrade, The piece ends with, if I had possessed a true feeling of civil virtue and courage, the most consistent way to express it would have been to stay in Bulgaria and to try to fight from there, just as people who are far more courageous, honest and gallant than I am have done. Защото, колкото и да е, ние бехме едно такова семейство, което на фамилия, което на прилив и нотлив, познати приятели не смеха да се отбият в къщата. Само ще ви кажа, че когато Георги го убиха и тук два дена висеше една волга на това и снимаше всеки човек, кой, ама без да се крият всеки човек, който влизаше в къщата. Георги Марков had become an unperson. His, his books had all been taken out of the library, his plays had been taken out, and nothing was performed uh, again. And, and so you didn't even know he existed, but that was the way you know, uh, things weren't in, um, in Eastern Europe. Change slowly embraced Bulgaria too, in November of 1989. Events came to a head only when the communist government, which was still clinging to power, reneged on promises it had given. 
Days before the first free elections on June 10, 1990, the streets and squares were filled with more than a million people, expressing their hopes for rapid changes to their living conditions. But their hopes were dashed. The Bulgarian Communist Party, which had changed its name to the Socialist Party shortly before the elections, unexpectedly won the most votes. Rumours began flying that elections had been rigged. On August 26, the Communist Party headquarters in Sofia was set on fire. It was almost a year after the changes before the Red Star was removed from the party headquarters, but for months before that, state security had been busy purging the archives of all incriminating traces of his activities. Annabelle had been waiting a whole 12 years for these changes to occur. From London, she followed the events unfolding in her late husband's homeland with great interest. In January of 1990, when she learned of the Democrats' drive to investigate Georgi's murder, she left immediately for Sofia. Yeah, I was quite frightened about it. I heard that there were moves in Bulgaria, and I just decided to come, and I think it was really fate, uh, because everybody said to me afterwards, how did you know that was the right moment to come? Because all the press were here because there was an economic conference in Sofia. I had a passport in my maiden name, so I got into Bulgaria without them even knowing I was coming. Did you have any contact with the state security or something? No, what, what happened was um, I saw the first broadcast about Georgie, and it was an extremely irritating program. It was by somebody who had been a friend of Georgie's but had worked for the system and I was so angry about this that I I decided to do a broadcast on the radio and so Lubin, Georgie's cousin, arranged it and in this broadcast I said that it was time for Bulgaria to tell the truth about what had happened because they could never hope to have a a clean future unless they told the truth. So the next thing that happened <laughs> was that I was summoned to have tea with Alexander Lilov in the Politburo building. He was a deputy to Zhivkov, and I left my coat downstairs, and nobody was there, went up in the lift, and got to the office. There were two doors with a bugging equipment, it looked like wires in between the two doors for his office. And I went in for maybe, um, half an hour, and he was very, very charming to me and said he'd admired Georgie, Georgie as a writer and all this stuff. Lilov assured Annabelle that the new leadership would do everything necessary to solve Georgi Markov's murder. And it was then that the Bulgarian state security realized it was time to obliterate all traces of the crime, as investigative journalist Kristof discovered. The destruction of Досетата на Георги Марков става на една много важна дата – 10 януари 1990 година. Това е денят, в който съпругата на Георги Марков е пристигнала изненадващо в България, госпожа Анабел Маркова, и има среща с един от лидерите на БСП, Александър Лилов. И документът, с който е изискано досието на Георги Марков в разузнаването, носи същата дата. Така че за мен е безспорно, че хората, които са участвали в тази мокра поръчка, са си дали много ясно и добре сметка, че е по-добре да се залечат документите за това престъпление, отколкото да лежат в затвора за него. И така досиите бъде лодени на трябва на нощ и дървени на стрикт секреси до Пърник, където те бъде инсинирани в фърнеси на Стамана стилфактори. Някои от тях са бъде виктим на стат секурити и на интерия министрия документ средиста. Shortly after Annabel Markov's trip, Lord Watergrave, a close family friend and the British Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs at the time, arrived for an official visit in Sofia. Under other topics, he also raised the question of uncovering the truth about Georgi Markov's murder. I met with my opposite number, um, the Deputy Foreign Minister, uh, who was also a party official. Uh, in as far as I remember, in the party offices, as usual, this was always a little bit of a symbol. You didn't meet the ministers in, in uh, government offices. You met the party officials where the, where the uh, power really was. I then said, Minister, um, I'm very pleased to hear, as you say, that um, uh, Bulgaria is now 
completely changed and that we are dealing with Democrats and a country where there is law. Uh, I would therefore be most grateful if you would tell us uh, uh, the information behind the murder of Georgi Markov in London and in particular give us the names of the people who perpetrated this crime. Now, he could not disguise the fact that he was an unreconstructed member of the old regime because he said, automatically he said, Markov was murdered by the British Secret Service in order to uh, damage the reputation of the People's Republic of Bulgaria. So I had to think rather quickly what to do. Uh, this was a, obviously a futile conversation. I had learnt what I came to find out, namely that these people were the same people as before. The Markov case has generated a lot of propaganda and a lot of counter-propaganda. And a lot of lies. And a lot of lies. Um, there have been lies on both sides. I mean, there have been conjectures by a variety of media. Uh, and because it was kept so secret during the Cold War, Nobody in Bulgaria knew at all what was going on. Um, it, 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 it created a situation which is still very much prevalent today. So at the moment, the anti-communist Bulgarians believe that it was the Bulgarian state security, secret services of the communist era, that commissioned, ordered and executed Markov. On the other hand, the people who are uh, still communist in their mentality, if not in their political beliefs. They believe exactly the opposite. They believe that uh, Bulgaria had nothing to do with the case, that it was an internal struggle between the CIA. They literally quote Todor Zhivkov. A conference entitled War on the Ether was held in Sofia. Richard Cummings, the former security director of Radio Free Europe, arrived to take part. His most important topic, Georgi Markov. I have to thank Rush Johnson for introducing this uh, discussion by mentioning uh, everybody likes spy stories, so I'll be the one who will be giving some spy stories here. And we also have a small PowerPoint presentation, uh, which I think is important because it gives some images to just the words that I'll be speaking. And her wildest dreams, Agatha Christie couldn't have conjured a more bizarre murder or a more bizarre murder weapon than the one that killed a Bulgarian writer named Georgi Markov. His death, Georgi's death, proved how far a totalitarian regime would go to protect itself from the truth. And his murder remains one of the Cold War's greatest mysteries. The prime suspect in the murder is somebody named Francesco Galino, who had the code name Piccadilly. He has disappeared since 1992 as well. And Bulgarian intelligence and police officers, I believe, are still investigating this as an open investigation, and Scotland Yard in England, even today, is still investigating Georgi Markov. The Bulgarian investigation into the Markov case finally began in October of 1990, after Zelo Zelev, the first democratically elected president, assumed his post. Zelev promised to uncover the truth about the murder and signed an agreement with the British, allowing representatives of their secret services to exchange information. Strangely, one of these official delegates from MI6, a man by the name of Whitehead, had known about a Danish-Italian named Gulino as early as 1991. While Scotland Yard investigators only found out about his existence from their Bulgarian counterparts quite a bit later, probably in the May of 92. For several years now, the dossiers in the state security archives in Sofia have been accessible. Luba Markov, still unable to find peace after his cousin's murder, showed us part of Gulino's dossier which has survived despite attempts to destroy the state security archives. Among the surviving materials, he found the agent's fake passports, for example. Francesco Gulino, Doyle's passport, Schweizer's passport, Marinelli Renato. In a profile on Galino before he was recruited, state security described him as a likeable young man, assured with an unusually clear, resourceful mind. He trades in anything that brings quick profits, often pushing the limits of the law. He speaks several languages. Uh, Markov's 
Това е декларацията, собствено ръчно написаната декларация през на април месец 1971 година в Франческо Голино. The Bulgarian authorities had arrested Galino twice for smuggling and gave him the choice, prison or collaboration. Galino signed his handwritten declaration of cooperation on April 6, 1971, promising never to reveal his missions to anyone and using the pseudonym Piccadilly. The same text was typed up the next day and signed. Among other things, his dossier also contains documents about his training as an agent and about his many meetings with his handling officer. На агента Пикадили с водещи офицер Мичо Генковски. Октомври 76-та година подробно се обсъдили насоките за работа и престой в Лондон. Изучаване на условията и преселване там започване на търговска дейност. At that time, Piccadilly was trying to create a false identity for himself in Copenhagen. Учени... 1200 английски лири от Пикадили. Дания, за да не ги сменя, да не прави ченче в Лондон, да не прави впечатление, защото трябва да се регистрира. 13 октомври 1977. Receipts in British pounds are proof of his many trips to London shortly before Markov was attacked. Но всичко това, обединено, макар и като косвени доказателства, обединено в... Крайна сметка даваше извода, че тук става въпрос именно за това, което е било подготвено и извършено по отношение на Георги Марков. Establishing his false life in Copenhagen beginning in March of 1975 was harder than expected. The plan was for Galino to start trading in antiques, but his business initially didn't take off. At a meeting with his control officer, Piccadilly complained that he could barely make ends meet. For these meetings, they had a special place. This is the uh, entrance to the old wax museum here in the Tivoli Garden. But over there on the right side, that column is the signal area where Golino would have put a cross to his handler from the Bulgarian intelligence service showing that everything was okay and that they could continue with the meeting, which would then take place about five minutes from here. This was called Katrin. This was the code name for this entry to the Wax Museum. In January of 1992, two years after Annabelle's visit to Sofia and the Bulgarian promises to uncover the truth about the murder of Georgi Markov, the first trial was held for destroying dossiers related to the Markov case. The defendants were the former Deputy Interior Minister Stoyan Savov and the Head of Intelligence General Vladimir Todorov. However, Stoyan Savov killed himself two days before the trial began in a small park outside of Sofia. The trial was heard before the military tribunal of the Bulgarian Supreme Court and dragged on for months. The Head of Intelligence, General Todorov, was now the only defendant. During the previous year, Todorov had cleared out to Moscow for six months. He was forced to return after a series of extradition requests. During the trial, it was established that out of the 16 volumes of documents on Markov, only one folder had survived by chance. As early as 1971, state security had begun keeping a dossier on Markov under the codename Vagabond, which was closed on December 5, 1978, with the following note, killed in September 1978 in London, England. At the time of the murder, General Todorov was head of the first main department within state security, which was in charge of all kinds of wet jobs. It was almost certain that the missing dossiers contained a plan for Markov's murder, like those that have been found in similar cases. That could have been the reason that the documents were destroyed by those involved in the dissident's physical liquidation. По други дела, по които ние сме а, работили по това време, пак подобни на, на този случай, ние открихме конкретен план за убийство, в който е посочено как да бъде убит един човек, който е противник на властта. Въпреки а, старанието да бъдат заличени всички следи, свързани с а, това престъпление, успяхме да достигнем до твърдото убеждение, че Това е организирано от първо главно управление, 
чрез възлагането на техен сътрудник, който е извършил прострелването на Георги Марков с една съчма. The former KGB general Oleg Kalugin had made the sensational confession that the KGB had helped Bulgarian state security organize Georgi Markov's murder. And that's not all. He also named Yuri Andropov, the future Soviet head of state, and Vladimir Krishkov, the head of the KGB, as moral accomplices. On the Bulgarian side, he named intelligence chief Vasil Kotsev and his deputy Vladimir Todorov as partners in the operation. Есть просьба Стоянова о том, чтобы мы помогли болгарским друзьям расправиться с Марковым, который когда-то был вхож в семью Живкова, знал многие стороны жизни его двора и его личного. И вот эта значит, просьба Стоянова была крючком доведена до Андропова. According to Kalugin, Markov's fate was decided in early January 1978 at a meeting in Andropov's office at the KGB's Lubyanka headquarters. Kalugin was also present. Andropov, who at that time was still boss of the powerful KGB, seemed hesitant, not wanting to get involved in Bulgarian problems. But when Krishkov mentioned the Soviet Union's good relations with Bulgaria and Konzivkov's personal request for help, Andropov agreed to help the Bulgarians prepare the assassination by sending them the necessary equipment and instructors. According to Kalugin, Andropov wanted to avoid the direct participation of the KGB. После этого, значит, мои два сотрудника поехали в Софию и встретились с болгарскими товарищами. И далее они приступили к конструктажу уже конкретных лиц, которым было поручено осуществление этой акции. What prompted the former KGB officer to break the code of silence? Could his confession have been coordinated with the KGB under certain conditions so as to cover up their more significant participation in the murder? убийството на Георги Марков в 1978 година. Има много интензивни срещи между Калугин, който е поел от съветска страна да помага на българските другари. Началник на този отдел е полковник Мичо Генковски, водещо офицер на агент Пикадили. Да не си задем въпроса, какъв е резултатът от тази съвместна работа по делото Скитник? Първоначальна попитка била значит вывести Маркова из строя путем нанесения ему на пляже. Он в то время должен был отдыхать где-то на Средиземном море. Нанести ему маленький такой мазок на теле, что было в условиях пляжной суеты и толкать нелегко сделать. Предполагалось, что эта мазь, а такая существует у нас в КГБ, она вызывает остановку сердца через, ну, условно говоря, через сутки, там, ну, в зависимости от состояния организма. When Kalugin arrived in London in 1993, he was immediately arrested. He had said in too many interviews too much, also contradictory, about his involvement in the plans for Markov's murder. After many hours of interrogation, he was released. The reason? There wasn't any proof that this crime had been committed in England, therefore he could not be brought before an English court. According to Kalugin, many attempts were made to liquidate Georgi Markov. One option was to assassinate him during his summer vacation. It was either June or July, and this was the first real holiday we'd had for ages, you know. When we were there, we got a warning. I mean, I always think of that as a sort of image of the holiday, because everybody sits in a deck chair facing the sea, and he sat with his back to the sea. So you could see anybody coming behind. Er hat in ständige Aufmerksamkeit gelebt. Und schließlich, endlich wurde ihm das alles gleichgültig. Also der Tod, der, der Tag und Nacht, neben ihm, wie, wie, wie sein Schatten, sich bewegt hat. Schließlich hat er gesagt, jetzt halt es nicht mehr aus. Passiere was möge. As early as January 1978, Georgi's brother Nikola received warnings about him. Nikola was the direct contact for the source, a Bulgarian emigrant living incognito near Munich. He was known to have close ties to Bulgarian state security and was playing a dangerous game. 
Only now, after his death, has Nikola Markov revealed his identity. Reuben Konstantinov era un personaggio con doppia faccia. Lui non ha mai riconosciuto di essere un agente, ma lui faceva affari, business, con i compagni bulgari. Con altre parole, il suo lavoro era di arricchire se stesso e arricchire i compagni bulgari. Se stia cioè, Ivan Konstantinov, nel 1993 году ми каза, че той на него му е възложено в Сърдиния периодики да му сипе от Вика, утре ще ми звънат на вратата и ще ми забия това кочуема в корема. И му е предадена отровата? Ами, той ми каза, че срещите, той е поддържал контакт с тогавашния заместник, шеф на първо глава на правене, Владимир Тодоров. И той е срещите в някакво кафене в Виена, Konstantinov met Todorov, who was the man in, counter, in charge of counterintelligence at that time, the one responsible for the Markov murder, most likely. He met him in Vienna and received the poison that should have been put into the drink or into the food of Markov, if possible. Konstantinov retained that poison until the mid-1990s. That poison was not brought to London because it was not what was going to be used in London. Getting back to the crime scene, how did the assassination of Markov take place? Was he waiting at the bus stop when he was attacked? Or was he in motion? Did he walk across the bridge to the BBC? Yeah. And he passed the bridge on this day also? Yeah. He wasn't taking a bus? He didn't t t take um, buses usually. He was very athletic. He would always walk and he would always run up the stairs of Bush House rather than get the lift. Um, so he, I very much doubt that he was waiting for a, a bus. As Markov would be moving, it's very difficult to hit a moving object. And if you're trying to actually make contact with somebody who's moving in front of you, it's, it's pretty hard. And to invest that much money, that much time, and that much effort into killing somebody, you would then try to send a team in there. And the ideal way to do that would be to stop Markov somewhere, to allow the, the assassin, to use that phrase, to come up behind him or on the side of him and use that weapon. More evidence of teamwork is the fact that even in 1978 there wasn't anywhere within sight on either the south or north end of the bridge where taxis could wait. One can hardly imagine that a secret service would leave it to chance that the murderer would be able to slip away quickly and unnoticed from the scene of the crime. It would make much more sense for the driver of the cab to be waiting under the bridge where he could see the killer quickly coming down the stairs. Scotland Yard searched for that mysterious taxi early in the investigation, but was unable to find either the driver or the car. And what about the weapon? Is the umbrella a distraction? The fact is, Markov felt something strike his right thigh, turned around, saw that assassin who dropped the umbrella or heard the umbrella drop and then turned around. But he saw the umbrella on the ground. Markov never saw the other weapon that was used. Did he describe any weapon? Uh... No, he didn't. I mean, the, the, he didn't say that he was prodded with an umbrella. He didn't even say anything that there was an umbrella. Therefore, when he told people about the umbrella and then the newspapers picked up on it, on the imagery of an umbrella murder, then this is where the, the term umbrella murder has developed for the last 30 plus years. 
when we look at the past experiences of the KGB and other intelligence services, such a weapon in the shape of a fountain pen or like a fountain pen had been used for many, many years. And, and a contact weapon means basically that this weapon would have had to have contact something. There had to be a physical contact. There's no pistol involved. The, uh, there's no trigger involved. It's strictly that. It forces then the gas and it forces the pellet into the body through the genes. The fatal bullet didn't even leave a hole in his genes. It had a diameter of only 1.5 millimeters. It was made of an alloy of platinum and iridium, with two holes drilled in the middle of it by a laser at a right angle. They were sealed with a kind of wax, which melted at body temperature, releasing the fast-acting poison ricin into the bloodstream. A milligram is fatal. Derived from castor beans, ricin blocks protein synthesis. After four to six hours, it causes high fevers and internal hemorrhaging. Death occurs two to four days later. I'm, I'm sure that he was killed effectively by the KGB. The KGB is good at poisoning people, as we know from Britain only recently. That's one of their preferred methods of choice. In a group of buildings very close to the Lubyanka, the infamous Laboratory 12 is located, which was part of the KGB's operational technology department and was also known in the West as the Chamber. As early as 1945, there was being developed the rapid-acting poison ricin, which was not proven at the time. Hundreds of German and Japanese prisoners of war were killed in cruel experiments to perfect the sinister recipe. From the, the, the sophistication of the methods used, it had to be a state security apparatus which did it. The Russians were, were particularly good at this kind of thing, but they would use their surrogate, their little brother, the, the, the Bulgarians, and preferably someone who, who wasn't even Bulgarian. Say someone who you would invent in a James Bond novel, um, an Italian of Danish origin or a Dane of Italian origin. By that, Cockrell meant Agent Piccadilly, whose trail Antony Georgiev traced to Budapest after Piccadilly had disappeared from Copenhagen in 1993. Did you find the Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, then I called telephone inquiries in Budapest, in Hungary, and they gave me a telephone number, which belonged to this address. And I tried to call him a number of times. So and I left a message on the answering machine. My name is this and this. I'm calling from America. I would like to talk to you. And Gurin returned my call. And... Um, he was very reluctant to say anything that could in any way be considered, uh, you know, implicating for him in, in anything at all. It was actually a very, very short conversation. I mean, my initial reaction, my knee-jerk reaction as a journalist was to actually go to Budapest and try to find him. Mm. Uh, we didn't do this for a variety of reasons. One, that was a very tumultuous time for, for, for the radios in Munich. Yeah. Second, Rich Cummings, who was chief of security at the radios in Munich, was not completely certain that we must be doing this because he could not guarantee my security yeah. when I went to Budapest. Mm -hmm. uh, so we kind of let it simmer, let it stay. And then something very, very strange happened. Uh, a woman from Denmark called. Mm -hmm. She introduced herself as a journalist, but she told me that she just re received the fax from a woman in Budapest, and she sent that fax to me. And uh, it turned out that uh, that fax had been written by a woman Gurin was staying with in Budapest. And it becomes quite apparent that this Hungarian woman who is related to Bolivar, he's very scared. It must be over there, most probably. This is, uh, you know, top shelf literature. <laughs> okay. Stare to go. Mm, here. Oh. So, uh, let me see. There we go. There we go. Ah. There we go. Mm -hmm. This is the facts. With my handwriting at the mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. um, there's written Dear Elizabeth. Yeah. This is the name of the Danish woman I told you about. Yes. This woman, Elizabeth, had been to Budapest during the Cold War. 
And she told me that this woman, the Hungarian woman, called Aniko. Aniko. That's her name? Yeah. Mm -hmm. She was acquainted with... Gulino. Yeah. Gulino. Yeah. Apparently, he was staying with her in, in Budapest. So she said that uh, Gulino was a strange person. It's all in the facts, actually. Mm -hmm. It's all in the facts. But Elizabeth... But what was me, the reason that she was writing to Elizabeth? Elizabeth told me that whenever she went to Budapest during the Cold War, she always got one and the same interpreter. Mm -hmm. And that interpreter was this woman. Ah. Uh, and in those days, in those days, when Danish journalists or any Western journalist was coming to Eastern Europe for one reason or another, it was very obvious that the interpreter had some, something to do with the secret services. And mm -hmm. There was no yeah. question about that at all. So Elizabeth always thought that this woman is somehow related you know, to the Hungarian communist secret services. You know. You know, people could not just walk like they do now. I mean, they had to be mothered about. In this fax to the Danish journalist from November 93, Gulino's Hungarian girlfriend, Aniko, wrote... He visits me once a month because some painters in Hungary work for him and paint paintings which he takes to auctions to Germany. Later in the fax, she says... Not long ago, he told me a long story that a strange thing happened to him. The Interpol is after him, and he then said that he used to be a spy for the Russians before the Iron Curtain was pulled down. I know that he does not dare to go to Denmark now. What I should like to ask you is to find me the newspaper cuts referring to Golino, either as a spy or a forger. Please do not mention my name to any police channel. I do not want by any case that Golino suspects my investigations. Do not use this fax number. This is my new workplace. Please send me the cuts of papers, if there is any, to my address by mail. I hope you are well. Love, Aniko. Following Georgiev's recommendations, we decide to meet up with the Danish journalists who were the first to release reports about Gulino in Denmark in 1993, after he had been interrogated by the Danish and British investigators. In this way, we hope to get in touch with the Danish journalist and through her with Aniko, the woman Galino was living with at the time. What I'd like to do now is show you a fax message that we received at Radio for Europe in November 1993. This yes. is the woman in Budapest that uh, Galino visited and stayed with in Budapest mm -hmm. and apparently was a partner of his at that time. And she writes this as we yep. get into okay. it, mm -hmm. why she's very nervous about the relationship she had with Galino. Yeah, this is the second page. Mm -hmm. And these notes here, mm -hmm. these are Anthony George's notes. Okay. This is the explanation of how we got the facts from this Danish non-political journalist in the November 1993. As you can read in here, she's talking also that she saw bodies of whatever in Budapest and then also she does mention in the here that there are plenty of artifacts we take that to be paintings some of them obviously stolen but do you think Galino could have been more than a forger would he anything that you in your research had indicated that he was a murderer that might have been involved in murder but I mean the, what, what the speculation was at that time that this this uh, art business was just uh, uh, a cover or mm -hmm. excuse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In mm -hmm. reality, he he might have been working for the mm -hmm. the intelligence service. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but but uh, corpses and and murder, and I, I have no idea. Nobody. I've never heard about it. Have you heard once from an Elizabeth Jensen, a colleague from you here in Copenhagen at that time? No, no. And have you ever heard the name of an Aniko Faludi from Budapest? No. I, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, sh maybe I've heard about it, uh, but not, not, I, I haven't been in contact with Elizabeth about it. Unfortunately, we don't discover any new contacts with Gulino's circle of friends. We are now going to see a colleague of Damkia who did an extensive background story about Gulino for Danish television at the same time in 1993. Perhaps he might know something. When was it the letter? 93? Okay. 
Mr. Brink, have you heard in the course of your research connected with Colino from a woman named Elizabeth Jensen, a Danish journalist who received a fax from Golino's friend Aniko? Did you have any information about that? No. I remember, no, vaguely, no. I mean, Julina was gone when we did the story. It's and very strange. You know Antony Georgiev? Yes. Antony Georgiev has spoken with Elizabeth Jensen about the case and about these Aniko Falugi. Georgiev contacted me at some point in time after my program. We were sort of in contact once in a while and he was sometimes in Denmark and I, I can't remember the details. And there was a time when he contacted me about the story and there was something I, can't, I simply can't remember what it was. Mm. But you, as a journalist, you heard n never before from uh, Elizabeth Chance no, as no, a no. colleague. No, I, uh, no, no. I can't remember it if I have. No. Mm -hmm. Brink still okay. tries to put us in touch with a member of the Danish Secret Services, again no, sadly unsuccessful. Clearly no one knows the Danish journalist who was a close friend of Gulino's girlfriend at the time. We try other yeah, tactics, well, looking for neighbours, friends and business partners from yeah, Gulino's parallel yeah, life as an antiques yeah, trader in the Danish yeah, capital, yeah, which lasted for more than 17 years. We start with his last known address in the suburbs of Copenhagen. The current owner is waiting for us. Nice to meet you. Yes, thank you. Yeah. That's Richard. Hello. My name is Klaus. Hello. Cameraman. Yes. Okay. Uh, maybe have a look. Yeah, of course. While he was in Copenhagen, Galino changed his home and work addresses repeatedly. Then he bought this house in the mid-1980s, perhaps because he thought his situation had finally stabilised. A report from his handling officer at the time states, The agent is not active at the moment, but in light of his work in the past, we must continue to monitor his surroundings. The situation got risky for Galino, alias Piccadilly, only after 1990, when the first information from Bulgaria reached Scotland Yard. The location of the house is striking, since it is very close to the motorway, which it has direct access to. Perfect for a quick getaway. The owner still wants to introduce us to a neighbour from that time who was in very close contact with Galino. So the older neighbour who actually comes, is already dement. Oh. Und ähm, der kann sich da eigentlich ja nicht mehr erinnern. Ja, 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 leider. Die Leute, die das Haus vorher hatten, die, äh, die haben auch keinen Kontakt gehabt zu Francesca. Oh, okay. Dem, der ja, Köpenfra. Ja. ja. Wo er dem? Wo er dem? Die ist schon Ja, die Also die, ähm, die, die es von Golino, also der Makler hat es auf einer Zwangsauktion ersteigert, ein Makler. Mhm. Und hat es dann an welche verkauft, die dort zehn Jahre gewohnt haben. Mhm. Und. Ähm, Die wiederum haben es von diesen Leuten gekauft, die seit neun Jahren jetzt hier wohnen. Da Eignung, da haben Mütter. Ja. Äh, da ist keiner, der, der ihn getroffen hat. Also keiner, keiner hat ihn getroffen. direkt mit ihm okay. quasi den Handel abgeschlossen. Mhm. Gut. Scotland Yard only learned from Bulgarian investigators in May 92 that Gorlino's trail led to Copenhagen. Later, the British enlisted the Danish intelligence services, who made contact with Gorlino and kept him under surveillance. Gulino was called to the Bellahoy police station on February the 5th, 1993 at 10 a.m. From there, he was taken to the central station, where he was interrogated at the offices of the Danish Secret Services by Commissar Paul Dinnison and Scotland Yard investigators Chris Bird and David Kemp. During the hours-long interrogation, Gulino was shown copies of eight documents from the Bulgarian archives, including three of his passports, his declaration of collaboration with state security, and receipts for money received. Gulino denied absolutely everything, including the document's authenticity and having had any contact with espionage organizations. Commissar Dinnison finally told Gulino that he believed the documents were authentic and that he would have to charge him with espionage, punishable by 12 years in prison. Around 9 p.m., Gulino was fingerprinted at the central building and was released after 11 hours of questioning. This interrogation was followed up by absolutely nothing. Despite the charges, Gulino was not arrested, and Denmark's official request to Bulgaria for legal copies of the documents was only sent nearly two and a half months later. Please have a seat here. Thank you very much. Why did the Danes let Gulino go? 
Could there have been other reasons for not taking decisive action, given such overwhelming suspicion of espionage? So we have a man from Bulgaria comes here in 1976 named Gulino. Mm -hmm. He seems to be a sleeper, to use that phrase. And in 1978, he's activated yes. with the idea of killing Georgi Markov in London. Mm -hmm. The information stays quiet until after the collapse of communism in Bulgaria. Mm -hmm. The Bulgarians then work with Scotland Yard to reopen the investigation. They discover Galino. They come to Copenhagen, asked to meet with Galino. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you a direct question. Could, yes. could it have been possible that Galino offered to cooperate with the Danish PET at that time? No. The Scotland Yard yeah, is yeah, the yeah, responsible yeah, yeah, agency, yeah. or the Bulgarians? It could be another case if it was uh, cooperation between MI6 and, and, and the Danish National Security Service. Then so, would it be possible to, to make an agreement with him, tell us something about this and this, and then we will uh, try to, to um, handle, uh, handle your case in, in So that would way. be parallel uh, to Godayevsky again, where you have the Danish uh, intelligence right, service yes, yes, working yes, with yes, MI6. Yes, yes, yes. So Galino then is interviewed here. He's not arrested. Yes. Does this mean that as a result of a deal between MI6 and the Danish Secret Services, the decision was taken not to investigate Gulino's espionage activities and to give him time to disappear? How could Gulino have been useful to them? And why would MI6 be interested in such a deal? Had Agent Whitehead, MI6's envoy in Bulgaria, been informed about Gulino as early as 1991 by the Soviet double agent Gordievsky, without Scotland Yard investigators in charge of the case knowing about it. So what happened two months after the interrogation? Uh, he left his task, left his space, and as he was obliged by Danish law, he left a forwarding address mm -hmm. in Budapest. In Budapest. And that is, that is open information. Anybody can go mm -hmm. to the Danish register and find other people's addresses. Now, since that time, as far as I know, he has never been charged with anything anywhere in Europe. He's a free man. The address Galino left at the registration services was fake. At first, his trail went cold. But in the meantime, we placed an ad in a specialized Danish newspaper for antique traders and art dealers. Some of Galino's business partners responded to it, and we got in touch with them. Uh, hello, Eli. Here's nochmal Elmar. Uh, yeah. Hello, grüß dich. Grüß dich. Du. Ähm, wir waren jetzt gerade bei dem Auktionshaus Brun Rasmussen ja. und ähm, da haben wir leider den, ähm, den ähm, Ralf nicht getroffen, ja. ähm, aber ähm, da waren noch andere Mitarbeiter, die wollten oder konnten uns da aber leider auch nicht helfen. Also war da war es schon spät. geschlossen, es war schon ein bisschen spät. Ja, vielleicht noch mal. Oh, da kommt ja schon jemand, da kommt jemand, da kommt jemand. Die meinten aber, sie können sich an einen Gulino erinnern, das ist aber schon länger her gewesen. Ja, weil dein, dein Freund, ähm, Meir Gabrieli, hat ja gemeint, er war vor 18 Monaten hier. Hi. Hi. Entschuldigung für Stür. Ähm, ganz wirklich. Äh, ähm, ja. ja. Meinst du, er kommt regelmäßig aus, äh, aus, aus Österreich, sagtest du? Das kann ich nicht sagen. Ja. Weil, also, ähm, du meintest ja, das war Almstetten, oder? Das habe ich nicht richtig verstanden gestern. Nein, von Almstetten äh, Richtung Passau, in, in der Mitte von, äh, zwischen diese zwei. Okay, okay, das war's. Ja, auch so eine, so eine sehr bekannte Stadt, aber es, es fällt mir nicht jetzt äh, im Moment. Ja, Wels vielleicht, oder? Hat, nein, nicht Wels. Nicht, nicht Wels. Wels. Mhm. Nein. Mhm. Okay. Okay. Du. Und dort, dort, dort hat er gehabt, ein, äh, er sagt, einen riesen Laden mit, mit Möbel. Okay, das ist kurz. Danke, Eli. Bitte, ja. Zurück, was war zwischen Passau und Wels? Zwischen Passau und we can only guess. Ellie's words were extremely contradictory. Could we narrow our search for Galino to the border region between Austria, the Czech Republic and Germany? Or would we once again confirm the conclusion that in this story, as Richard keeps saying, nothing is as it seems? We constantly try to meet up with Ellie, but he always slips away. However, the next day, with Ellie's help, we set up a meeting at the Copenhagen Free Port area with another one of Gulino's colleagues. After a long search, we find the entrance at one of the warehouses. The address is hard to find, 
because there are few signs to indicate that an antique store was there. And from the looks of the entrance, it seems like the owners have no interest in attracting new clients. Once inside, however, the view is striking. Fine antiques as far as the eye can see. Am I a Gabrieli? Hello. And as we later find out, they are only sold container-wise, not to drop-in customers, but to affiliates, mostly in China, the United States, Eastern Europe, and Sicily. Tell us a little bit about uh, Francesco Colino. How did you well, uh, feel about it? As much I know about the guy, uh, always he was nice. Mm -hmm. uh, never never cheat anyone here, as I know. Mm -hmm. And for us, he was a good man, because he brought all the Italian customer here. Mm -hmm. So we could sell a lot there. Mm -hmm. you I get so acquainted with him, and uh, when was it? Well, we know him actually uh, through uh, the family tree of Ante in Italy. He was working as agent for them in Denmark. Ah. They were coming to Denmark to buy some antiques and paintings and all that, and uh, so he, could, he could talk Danish, so he did all the job for them in Denmark. Oh. Francesco Gurlino sold them... Um, Antique. No, not so. He, not so. He was working for them. He was working for he them. He was not by his own. He was always... Uh, mm -hmm. He was employed by them actually as agent in Denmark. Mm -hmm. And this Triofante family, where is she? she uh, in Sicily. In, in Sicily? Yeah. And where in Sicily, do you know? Uh, they are in Palermo located. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. Very famous family yeah. there, so... Yeah. If you go there, just ask the name, they will tell you. And when, when did you see uh, Francesco Colino's last time? I think it's about a year and a half. Mm -hmm. Last time I met him in Brun Rasmussen. Mm -hmm. And he, he told me... Ring. Yeah, he told me that he was working for an antique company in uh, Austria. Mm -hmm. And he gave me a visit card. I tried to find it for you, but... Oh, that would be nice. I know. Did I understand you were 18 months ago here in Copenhagen? 18 months ago in Copenhagen, yeah. He was here in visit. He didn't come to visit us. I were in the auction, ah. and he were with an Austrian guy, maybe to show him what he could buy by internet auction. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Internet auction? Yeah. Uh -huh. You heard about the rumors about Francesco Colino, I think. If you ask me if this guy can... Heard anyone? The answer is no. Mm -hmm. He's so nice and uh, mm -hmm. full of life, like mm -hmm. the good life, and mm -hmm. uh, always was happy. Give him a good food, a good bottle of red wine, nice girl. That's mm -hmm. Francesco. I don't think uh, Francesco could hurt anyone. And he was very nice, and he could talk a lot of mm -hmm. languages too. Mm -hmm. We had arranged with Ellie to tell him about our conversation with Maya Gabrielli. After that, he was supposed to meet with us, but in the end, he brushed us off completely. Alles klar. Danke. Gut. Bis dann. Tschüss. Ich hatte immer irgendeine Ausrede. Jedes Mal wieder. Vielleicht hätten wir schneller noch kommen müssen, dass er uns empfohlen hat, ihn anzusetzen. Richard suspects that Maya Gabrielli and Ellie must have talked 
and after this conversation, Ellie refused to meet with us. The hints that Gulino might be hiding in Austria, where he likely had some Austrian employer, were growing even stronger. There was one other important clue that largely coincided with the hints Gulino's colleagues had given us. Time to leave Copenhagen. In November 2002, a new clue appeared in a Czech police report. Francesco Gulino had been caught trying to cross the border from Bavaria into the Czech Republic while transporting the 1906 painting Salome, carrying the signature of the prominent Jürgensteel painter Franz van Stuck, that had been reported stolen. The police again let him go, since the identity of the painting isn't confirmed. Gulino continued on his way in a white Mercedes van, registered in the Austrian city of Wels. In Wels, we go to the city courthouse, where we find documents about a house that was sold at a court-ordered auction three years earlier. In the paperwork, we come across a tenant with a lifelong right of free residence in the building. His name? Francesco Gulino. Is this just a coincidence, or is this really Agent Piccadilly himself? Wie du weißt, ich bin jetzt mit Tatjana schon in Wels. Wir haben auch schon einige Ergebnisse. Wir haben also die Adresse lokalisiert wir, und wir werden wahrscheinlich morgen mal dorthin schauen, oh, okay. wo Gulino nun dieses Wohnrecht hat, dieses Lebenslange. Also ich vermute ja immer noch, das ist irgendeine Tarnadresse, wo der seine Bilder gelagert hat. Ich gehe immer noch davon aus, dass wir ihn nicht antreffen. Aber wir müssen auch damit rechnen, unter Umständen, dass wir ihn treffen. Wir können nach dem jetzigen Stand sicher davon ausgehen, dass Gulino in Wels nicht gemeldet ist. Nicht gemeldet? Nein, er hat hier offiziell keine Meldeanschrift. Aber er hat in dem gewissen Haus hat er lebenslanges Wohnrecht. Kann man das tun? Das hängt davon ab, wo er seinen Lebensmittelpunkt hat. Wenn er seinen Lebensmittelpunkt in Wels hat, dann müsste er zumindest mit einem Zweitwohnsitz hier gemeldet sein. Es gibt natürlich wahnsinnig viel Verbindung, vor allem über den Antikhandel, der ja auch, äh, Gulino hat ja schon in, den, in, in seiner Zeit als Agent in, in Kopenhagen, hat er ja äh, einen, einen sehr schwunghaften Antik- und Gemäldehandel aufgemacht in Kopenhagen und war damit auch recht erfolgreich. Hm? Hat damit auch gut verdient. Das steht ja alles in diesen, in diesen Berichten äh, da auch von der Staatssicherheit, ne? Die wir, die wir auch einsehen konnten in, 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 in Sofia. Ne? Lass mich eine Sache noch kurz schildern, die aufgefallen ist, als wir das Firmenbuch eingesehen haben. Wir hatten das bei diesem Antikhändler mit einer ganz kleinen Firma zu tun, äh, mit einem relativ geringen Kapital. Und auffällig ist, dass die im Jahr ab 92, 1993 mhm. anfangen, äh, auf eine extreme Art und Weise zu wachsen, Kapital anzuhäufen, andere Firmen aufzubauen, die alle ineinander verflochten sind. Und es beginnt alles zeitlich ungefähr ab dem Moment, wo Golino Kopenhagen verlassen hat. Kurz danach. Also zumindest nach dem Zeitpunkt, nachdem Golino von seinem Führungsoffizier sozusagen aus dem Geheimdienst entlassen wurde, nach der Wende, und Golino schauen musste, Wo baue ich mir denn eigentlich eine neue Existenz auf? 100%. As we made our way to the house listed in the court documents, we passed by an area with an enormous antique store. Here is registered the van that Francesco Gulino, alias Piccadilly, was stopped with on the border. Not far from there, we turn down the street towards the house where Gulino must live. Er hat keine Information, keine, er wird nicht kooperieren. 
du musst irgendwie das Vertrauen gewinnen. Pass auf, das sagt, ich kann nichts mehr sagen. Du pass auf, was du magst. Es sind vier Wohnungen in dem Haus, wie wir inzwischen erfahren haben. Wir waren ja noch nicht drin. Wir wissen auch nicht, wo, in welcher Wohnung Polino ist. Aber wir wissen, dass vier Parteien sind in dem Haus. Und wir denken, dass da auch bei den meisten Wohnungen kein Namensschild ist an der Wohnung. Hallo? Hallo? Jemand da? Hallo? Hallo? Ich suche die Frau Stelle ich Ihnen kurz die Kollegen vor. Oliver, Kammermann. Vielleicht kriegst du dann von daher. Ähm, ich setze mich jetzt mal vielleicht dahin. Und Sie haben ja so viele Bilder. Ja, ja. Äh, auf Ihre Spur, wenn man so will, äh, sind wir ja gekommen dadurch, dass Sie 2002 sind Sie ja mit einem Franz von Stuck Gemälde über die Grenze von Deutschland nach Tschechien. Vom Deutschland da wissen wir, nach Tschechien? Ja, da wissen wir mehr als Sie, ne? <lacht> vom Deutschland? Ja, Nicht? da bin ich nicht mehr. Ja. Und das Thema unseres Films ja. ist der Dichter und Schriftsteller und Journalist Georgi Markov. Ja. Aber es gibt ja Hinweise, dass Sie damals Agent der bulgarischen Staatssicherheit waren. Ja, ich gucke in Google, ich habe jetzt eine tausend Seiten. Ja, und Sie hatten aber verschiedene Pässe äh. mit verschiedenen Namen. Aber es gibt, ja. es gibt Ihre Bilder, die auch sehr ähnlich sind, muss ich sagen. Ich war sicher jung noch. Was uns als Kern interessieren würde, ist, äh, Sie waren ja in London zu der Zeit, als George Markov getötet wurde. Kann sein. Haben Sie noch Kontakt zu Ihrem damaligen Führungsoffizier Genkowski? Meine Karte, diese Kontakte, <lacht> glaube ich, ich will das sagen. So. Sie kannten ihn. <lacht> Micho Genkowski. Das ist, das ist eine intime Frage, meine, weil ich weiß, diese Branche, ja. <lacht> Wieso ist sie intim? Warum? Ist, ist sie so verboten? Händler mit diesen Leuten ab. Nein. Oh, oh, oh ja, 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 ja. Ist es strafbar? Man darf nicht äh, arbeiten mit einem ausländischen äh, Gemeindienst oder, oder so. Das, das kommt drauf an. Ich versuche es zu so leben legal lassen. Heute? Immer. Ich, ich, war, ich war nie angeklagt vor, vor keiner. Ich, war, ich denke, ich war nie, ich war nie äh, einmal. Äh, in Gefängnis oder in äh, gestraft oder nein. Bedauern Sie, dass äh, Georgi Markov umgekommen ist durch diesen Anschlag? Was kann ich tun? Was kann ich tun? Ja, aber Sie wissen, Sie wissen die Wahrheit. Warum soll Sie sagen die Wahrheit? Sie sagen seine Wahrheit, was ich denke, ist gut für die anderen. Aber die, 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 die die echte Wahrheit, sie behalte für sich selbst. Ist nicht so. Wenn Sie an diese alte Zeit denken, als Sie noch beim Geheimdienst waren, ja. und so, was, was fällt Ihnen denn da ein? Kein, keine Gefühle über diese oder so, ich habe keine Meinung. Ich habe Probleme, so abstrücken mich auf Deutsch. Das ist das Problem. Und was ist mehr wichtig für Sie? Mehr wichtig als Geld? 
What, more, what is more important than money? Uh, money comes first. Yes, yes, I, let me frank. Let's, let's, yeah, why not? What's wrong with money? It is. Where do you get the money from? Where do you live? Uh, I buy and I uh, try to buy as cheap I can and sell as expensive as I can. Nothing from secret agency, I swear to you. <laughs> they don't find it. They know from when did, when did you receive the last money from the secret agency? When did you receive it? It's an intriguing question. It's, a, it's part of the story. To make it to the, 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 the story it's more really intriguing. On the receipt. Signature, you know. <laughs> Talking to our dealer about signature. <laughs> I suppose you have not a pension. So I have a water. pension. You have a pension. Oh. From? Denmark. From Denmark. Yeah. You have a pension from Denmark. Yeah. I am only registered in Hungary at the Danish embassy. Oh. Did you can check. So the Danish the Danish know where you are. Oh yes. Oh yes. And they give the pension they give to your address in Hungary or to, to, to Austria? To my bank account. Uh, to your bank account in Austria? Yes. Why, in general, m one should say the truth. What for? You live so well with lies, isn't it? Or not saying nothing. Depends. What do you think is better to, to live with lies? If I was lying, then I must say I live perfectly well. <laughs> Were you the murderer from Georgi Markov or not? It, it's, I've got nothing to do with the story. I'm sorry. I wish I could give you a straight answer, but... But think for a moment. If I were... If I were the mother, do you think I should... I just say it. You know my theory about the truth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, the little I know of this Makarov is that it was nothing. It was nothing important. What was nothing important? It was. Oh. I uh, of course I read many versions. One they they try to 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 put him as a, a new pastor knock or soldier, you know, something like that. You know, he wasn't. Лъжи се, скъпи мои. Лъжи се все така необуздано, все така страстно се лъжи, защото лъжата ти дава много повече от истината. Лъжи се, скъпи мои. Лъжи себе си и всички до край. И когато дойде смъртта, опитай се и нея да излъжеш, че да си измислиш живот и за след това. Зайне е мордунг и си майне аугин. Айне литерарише с анеркенунг. Ди... Trotz ihres Dogmatismus, trotz ihrer sehr engen geistigen Horizonte, haben seine Mörder seine literarische Größe erkannt und durch seine Ermordung diese ihn als Schriftsteller anerkannt. We didn't expect Gulino to tell the truth about the assassination. He could hardly be the killer. His profile as an agent indicates otherwise. But the question of whether there was anyone else involved in the murder remains open. We head towards the Hotel Forum in Sofia. During the Cold War, it was a meeting place for dealers from the West and agents from the East. We meet a journalist and state security informant who in 1992, while working on a film for the BBC, stumbled across a man who'd landed at Heathrow from Prague the day of the attack and who seems to have left immediately after it. This stranger must also have played an important role in Markov's murder. The side of Golino, if it would be in a team from two prisons only, the other person would have to be the killer. Yes, absolutely. Who was it? It was a person we met, a person who, uh, by the way, it was a BBC reporter who actually brought the picture. There was a photograph of him coming into Heathrow Airport. And we had a picture of him. And we found the person together of this description and we actually talked to him. We called him the woodpecker. Who was it, this person? He was a diplomat working in Sweden before that, uh, who is clearly a member of the Kadese. He was probably prepared for it. There was some way to prepare him. 
He went and did it. He mm -hmm. was ready to, to do it. I mean, you have to be psychologically. Uh, of course, the Kadeh say, um, does a psychological test, can, can you kill somebody? Where is the photograph now, today? I don't know. It's, it, it has to be in the hands of the British Secret Service. Why they, they're not doing anything about it, I don't know. I, I gave it to the authorities, I gave it to the British police, I gave it to the Bulgarian police who, who investigated the thing. I think that uh, there is something in the interrelation between Georgi Markov, the British Secret Services, and probably from there towards Scotland Yard, that makes it a kind of a state secret and not wanting to, 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 to uh, actually show what the truth is because there might be some other truth which none of those institutions want to touch upon. We cannot check which parts of Beriano's statements are true, but even more serious voices deepen the suspicion that in the Markov case too many things are being covered up, including by the British, even today, more than 34 years later. Имаше за, за нас очевидно а, оперативна информация, която е била получавана чрез наблюдение на резидент на българското разузнаване. Очевидно ще ще да стане ясно за разсекретяване на техни действия като контрразузнаване по отношение на другото разузнаване. Всичко това разузнаванията и контрразузнаванията го крият, независимо от заявленията, които се правят на ляво и на дясно. He came in, like I mentioned, the day before or the same day, and then left very shortly, which means to us possibly he was in fact the assassin or at least the, the one who brought in the weapon into London and then recovered the weapon and brought it back out again. Coming in as a diplomat, using a diplomatic, um, whatever the word was, a diplomatic pouch, it would not have been examined. Uh, was uh, about anyone they found, MI5 in particular, and, the, and all the police, surveying people in the Bulgarian embassy, say, uh, either photographing them, was it a, a, perhaps an agent in the Bulgarian embassy? Did they know some uh, Bulgarian diplomat coming in the day before and then leaving the day after? Certainly, if anything of that came out in the open, that the British knew something, the British intelligence and security services knew something and didn't act on it, that would be a tremendous scandal, of course. So in, if it wasn't been for some individual outside the system, the story will, will not, uh, not be solved. It won't be resurrected. The, the, the whole investigation, the scandal, the murder, the plot uh, won't be pursued, certainly not by British government authorities or the police. Even if they are just on another case, of course, the uh, poisoning of Alexandra Litvinenko in London, 2006. So let sleeping dogs lie. It's more than 20 years since the investigation was reopened. The fact that Markov's murder has not been solved is not only due to the destruction of the dossiers in Bulgaria and the continuing distrust between investigators from the two countries, but more to the fact that the secret services often place themselves above the law, even in democratic societies. Judging by their own criteria in most cases, they look upon any type of disclosure as an act of hostility and therefore act one-sidedly in their own interests and not for the good of society. In November 2011, Georgi Markov's play, Under the Rainbow, is performed in Sofia for the first time since the democratic changes is a belated triumph, not only for Georgi, but also for Annabelle, because it proves that his work has outlived the communist regime in Bulgaria. I definitely think that the reports in absentia, that is his masterpiece, and that give, gives him his place in Bulgarian history. I wish that when people talk about it in the West, they wouldn't say, oh, the guy that got stabbed by an umbrella. They'd say, oh, the great writer. You know, the, the writer was so brave that he risked his life to tell the truth. This would be fantastic. Wir haben ein Sprichwort für die Bulgaren, das tausend Jahre alt ist und besagt, die Lebende Mach schließen den Toten die Augen zu. Die Toten machen die Augen von den Lebenden auf. 
aber unsere Zeit ist weit von dieser Weisheit entfernt.